Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. Shall we pray together? Our Father and our God, we thank you for another day. Thank you for the privilege of looking into the oracles. The Bible said, the entrance of your word giveth light. Say the words that I speak to you, their spirit and their life. And this time we now ask that you send forth your word again. Let it mix with faith in our hearts and both ourselves and all those who join us on this platform and all those who meet either as groups or as families who have been following the Bible study, all those who have adopted this as their church weekly Bible studies, we ask that you will stretch forth your hand and bless your people. Those that have come to join this study today, we ask that you reach out to each one and meet us at our point of needs. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. As we are looking at blessed are those that are being persecuted, we want to remember our brothers and sisters that are going through persecution of one sort or the other in different parts of the world. We ask this day that you will please strengthen their hearts, strengthen their hands, cause the spirit of glory to rest upon them. Thank you because we know you are doing a work in our midst. You are doing a work in our time. You have declared to us that this is a season of our Rehoboth. And we're asking that you cause your word to mix with faith in the heart of your people. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for leading us this way. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Last week, we began to introduce chapter 10, where we are looking at blessed a day which are persecuted. And we went through the introduction and some few issues that God allowed us to deal with as we try to define what persecution is and by what means can a person be persecuted. We went through several scriptures that established the fact of persecution in the word of God. And we saw that, yes, all who will live godly life in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. Today, we are going ahead. We will be starting with number two that says, is persecution compulsory for every disciple of Christ? Is persecution compulsory for every disciple of Christ? This is what we are about to discuss. We thank God for those who have joined to help us with uh, scriptures. Uh, Sister Priscilla from uh, Canada and uh, Sister Soma uh, from the U.S. who are standing along with us to read scriptures as well as uh, our brother Mark. Now, we will turn to scriptures, but before we get to read all the scriptures, let me ask Mark to read our theme text for us. Our theme text is Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Now, just to keep us abreast with the passage that we have been walking through as we study today again. Matthew chapter 5, at 10, 11, 12. Brother Mark. Matthew 5, verses 10, 11, and 12 in the New King James Version. Yeah. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Mm. Right. So now we're going to begin to read the scriptures because we want to look at the fact that is persecution compulsory for every disciple of Christ. We're going to pick 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 
Sister Priscilla, you will start reading that for us. Philippians 1, 29 to 30. Sister Soma, you will pick that for us. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. Brother Mark, you will pick that for us. And John 15, verse 18 to 20. Priscilla again. And then Mark 10, 28 to 30. Sister Soma. Let's try to read scriptures. I know last week we read some of that scripture when we're establishing the fact of persecution. But today now we are picking it up to now study again to find out is persecution compulsory for every disciple of Christ? That's what we want to look at now. Priscilla, 3.12. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Mm. Mm. Philippians 1.29-30, Sister Soma. All right. It says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Amen. Thank you. Brother Mark, First Peter 2, 21 to 23. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, the New King James, or in the King James Version, says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, John 15, 18 to 20. Priscilla? John 15, 18 to 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Mm. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember Mm. the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Amen. Thank you very much. Mark 10. 28 to 30, Sister Soma again. All right. It says, then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So Mm -hmm. Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're dealing with an issue here. Is persecution compulsory for every disciple of Christ? And the passages we have read give us a clear picture of the fact that persecution is part of our calling as believers. When Jesus Christ spoke in Matthew 5 on the month with the people he was preparing to become his apostles and was laying out line upon line what would be the kingdom lifestyle, what will be the way of the kingdom? One of the things that he spoke about prominently is the fact that blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake or for my sake. When they will revile you and speak evil falsely against you, great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. 
that immediately noted with us. And as I spent time last week, I was noting that all those who ever served God, who worked with God, they have been persecuted. And that persecution is the context in which the work of God has grown, in which the church has developed. There has been no time that the church had the greatest impact except in the context of conflict, opposition, and persecution. Even the English Bible that has now become a blessing to the whole world and from generation to generation for over 400 years, it came as a result of persecution. William Tindale that God used to translate the Bible into English out of passion in his own heart was actually tied to the stake and was roasted alive because he had translated the word of God into English. Now, persecution has always been part and parcel of the Christian life. So let's take a costly look at the passages we have read. They will recall as we are going on in this study today, but let's lay it together. Now, that scripture in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that we read and noted, it said, Yea, but maybe I should have read it from verse 10 so that you can see how it came up in verse 12. So let me read verse 10, 11, 12, 13 in order to set it in context. He said, but thou hast fully know my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, here was Paul writing again a letter to Timothy who had been his son in the faith and whom he had spent time in discipleship over his life, he said to him, he said, you have fully known my doctrine. You know what I preach. You know my manner of life. You know my purpose. You know my faith. You know my long suffering. You know my charity. You know my passion. And you know my patience. But you also know my persecutions afflictions which came unto me at Antioch I was touched that almost everywhere he went persecutions were the issue around his life he said you know my persecutions afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra And if we were to take time to now go back to the narratives in the Acts of Apostles and we now pick it one by one, you will see the kind of cruel persecution that Paul went through. There were times they dragged him in the market square on the floor for doing nothing apart from preaching Christ. There were times they just threw them into jail, bounded together. No trial, just because of the name of Christ they preached. There were times that they were given serious beating. He said three times he was given 39 lashes. Three times. He said three times I was beaten with rod. Now all of this, he said, yes. All that we live godly in Christ Jesus shall. When the old King James used the word shall, 
It means undoubtedly. It means it will surely happen. Except you don't want to live godly life in Christ Jesus. Except you want to be one of those people who are neither hot nor cold, who is standing in between. Except you want to be one of those reeds who bend to every wish, every wind, every idea, every opinion, and you have no stand for Jesus, then such persons may escape persecution, but the truth is that they are not candidates for heaven at all. So, let's note from that scripture that persecution actually is compulsory for every disciple of Christ. And we're going to see why it will be. Now, when we read Philippians 1, 29 and 30, which Soma was the one that read it for us, can I ask you to read it again, Sister Soma? Philippians 1, 29 and 30. All right. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. He said, for to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ. If I pick it from the New Living Translation Bible, it said, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this fight together. You have seen me suffer for him in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of this great struggle. I want you to see that because unless you have a correct understanding and perspective of the Christian life, the life of a disciple, you will not understand that persecution is a privilege. To suffer for Christ is one of our own privileges. And when the disciples of old, the apostles and the disciples in the New Testament, when they were beaten, when they were molested, when they were persecuted, the Bible said they went away rejoicing, thanking God for counting them worthy to suffer for Christ. So you see, the believers that were raised in the early times, they did not see persecution as something strange. Actually, they looked forward to it as a privilege of taking, being a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. They were partakers of the testimony of Christ and all that the world system was doing against Christ when they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, they regarded it as the greatest privilege. And so every believer in those days, they look forward to persecution, not that they work for it, not that they caused it, but they look forward to it. They felt it was one of the high points of their faith to be so persecuted for Christ to be identified with the name of Jesus Christ to the point that the enemies of Christ have also regarded them as their own enemies. This is one thing that you see all through the scripture. He said, to us, it has been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this fight together. So I want you to know that the battle that occasions the persecution of a child of God is a general battle. Any and every one of us, wherever you are, in any part of the world, regardless of race, regardless of color, where you stay, once you belong to Christ, persecution is our family heritage. It's a family heritage privilege. And it only shows that you are actually a correct child of God when the world system persecutes you. 
That's what they did to all the prophets that were before us. That's what they have done to all the believers that sincerely stood for God in any generation. Whether in Asia or in America or in Europe or in Africa, anywhere where anyone dared to stand for Christ, they have been so persecuted. And even now, as I'm talking, we are still in this fight together. He said, you have seen me suffer for him in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of this great struggle. I've not left it. We are still in it up to now. That is the matter. Now, and when Mark read for us First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 23, I want you to see something that peculiarly touched my heart there. I want you to look at it now. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. He said, the New King James that our brother read, pointed, said, for to this you are called. Brothers and sisters, take note now. It's our calling. Said, to this you are called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We were called into it. It's a calling. You can't be a Christian, you can't be a genuine disciple and not experience this call. You can't be part of the family and not experience the privilege that is common to all of us. Now, he said, who committed no sin? nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was revived, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So this is to what we are called. So if as a student in a secondary school, because you stand for Christ, your fellow classmates or even your teachers begin to yell at you and make you feel bad because they feel that you are, I don't know what they call you, they may say you are something phobic or something, whatever they say, all just to make, pull you down, put you down as if something is particularly wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. Actually, everything is right with you. When the world system stands against you and begin to persecute you, it already shows that something in your life is pinching them. It means the life light is beginning to shine so much that darkness can no longer contain and they are feeling that you are becoming a threat. And I'd like to say to you that the reason why a child of God is persecuted is that one child of God who is standing for Jesus Christ is a threat to a thousand unbelievers. A thousand unbelievers gathering together, they feel threatened simply because you are standing for Jesus. That's why they are shouting. That's why they are shouting. That's why they don't want you to stand. That's why they don't want you to preach the gospel. That's why they don't want you to even just demonstrate that I belong to Jesus. If you wear just your brooch and you said, Jesus is Lord, you will see A lot of people, they say, remove that thing. We don't want it. What is the problem? Others have worn their own symbol of the dragon. Some have been wearing all kinds of things. They said they are for the devil. And it didn't bother anybody. It didn't bother anybody. But when you wear your sign of the cross and you put on it, Jesus is Lord. Or I am for Jesus. Or Christ is my Lord. Everybody in Jitri said, you are condemning us. You are making us feel bad. You are doing this. You are doing that. You say, for what? It is because one child of God standing with Christ's life is a threat, I say, to a thousand unbelievers put together. They are afraid. They are Jitri. Your life continues to remind the devil of his defeat. So if there's anything he can do to silence you, cut you off, take you off the scene, he would like to do it. It's our privilege. It is to this we were called. The Bible said, 
he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and yet he was revived. Yet he was persecuted. Yet he suffered. But he didn't threaten. So we are going to see what will be our attitude as the children of God following the life of Christ when we are being persecuted. He said, when he was revived, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He did not begin to call curse down upon the people. He did not begin to pray the prayer of fire upon the lives of those who are persecuting him. You remember what he did? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. That is the life we are to live. The more you do that, the more you are piercing the heart of those people with the sword of the Spirit. It's our privilege. And so I want to note that as we're going on here, if we are talking of persecution, is it compulsory for every disciple of Christ? I would say yes. A resounding yes. And John 15, that we now want to read, verse 18 to 20, I think we read it before, but let me ask us to now highlight some of the issues that Jesus raised there. In John 15, from verse 18, verse 18, I want to see whether we can check it from other versions that may make it a little more explicit. But New King James said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. That gives the basis. That gives the reason why persecution from the world system is actually a necessity. The reason is clear. He said the world hates you. It was not you they hated first. It was me. So for every persecution that is coming to you as a child of God, please get to know this now. It is a persecution that is transferred aggression. It's a transferred aggression. It's because the citizens of this world, they say, we will not have this man to reign over us. And here you are, his ambassador. Here you are, his witness. So if they decide to slap you, it's as if they wanted to slap Jesus whom they did not see. And since you are the one they can see, they are slapping him, but in you. That is what they are doing. And so when that happens, it's okay. It's a privilege. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So that's the next thing we will need to note. If you were of the world, if you have compromised with the world, if you have fitted into the world system, and if you like to go the way of the world, they will not persecute you. They will love you. The world will love its own. But now you are not of the world. Because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And remember the word that I said unto you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. That is the basic baseline on the issues that we have been raising on the matter. Can you read that John chapter 15 from verse 18 from any other version you have? Is there any other version that any of you can help us read? I have the Amplified Bible. All right. Read Amplified. Let's see how it sounds. Yes, John 15, 18 through 20 in the Amplified says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Mm. If you belong to the world, the world would treat you with affection and would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, no longer one with it, mm. I have chosen, selected you out of the world. The world hates 
detests you. Mm. Mm. Remember that I told you a servant is not greater than his master, is not superior to him. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word and obeyed my teachings, they will also keep and obey yours. Now, it can be clearer than this. He said, if you belong to the world, the world will treat you with affection and they will love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, you are no longer one with the world. This is why the world hates, detests you. And for me, that is a great mark of a child of God. If the world has not detested me, if the world is still at peace with me, if the world is still, you know, shaking hand with me with their hand gloves, then something is wrong with me. It means there's something of the world that is inside of me. That's why they have loved me. But if I were of Jesus and I'm no more of the world, I'm no more one with it, I'm no more in agreement with the world, you know what the Bible now says? This is the reason why they hate you. They detest you. They don't like to see someone like me on the face of the earth. Even as you see me preaching and teaching the word of God, they don't like it. They say, if I were a preacher that just tell general stories, that just tell people what they want to hear, and uh, permit worldliness and worldly standards, and continue to go with it, and they preach the psychology of the world, and they talk about the motivational speaking that the world system likes, and I do not condemn sin. Why not? They will just clap for me. They just say, this is one of our own. Even though it's on the poopy, but it's one of ours. Now, but when you stand for Jesus, when you stand for the truth, the world detests you. And I want you to know now, that world that detests you, they may not even be the world that is in the world alone. There are the world that has already entered the church. And so all those that are worldly Christians, all those that are worldly but inside church, they will still detest you. They will still fight. They will still persecute you. That's why some of us, our persecution even came from churches. Our persecution came from denominations. Our persecutions came from even preachers who felt that your message is a threat to what they are doing. They will still persecute you. So let's know that when we talk about persecution, persecution will come to you from anyone who does not love Jesus or who is one with the world system. So don't only expect that persecution is coming from those who are out, out, out there as unbelievers particularly. Anyone at all who is in league with the world system. Anyone at all who has lower standard as to become friendly with the world. He will persecute Christ. Please take note of that. I'm sure as we go on reading you will soon discover that Whosoever loves the world, the Bible said the love of the Father is not in him. It's not in him. He said, don't you know that friendship with the world, to be a friend with the world, is to be an enemy of God. So that's how it is. So once you are living the life of a disciple and you are no longer of the world, you are no longer one with the world, you are no longer comfortable with the world standard. You are no longer allowing the world to squeeze you into his mold. Then the world will put a fight against you. Then the world must stand up to persecute you. This is compulsory unless you have become a compromiser. So let's quickly agree now. 
when you are no longer persecuted for Christ's sake, for the word of God, for righteousness, for standing on the truth, let it be clear to you, you have become lukewarm. You are becoming one with the world. Because the world has not changed its position as far as Christ is concerned. Up to now, the world system, and you find it in all kinds of things. You see it being built up into our constitution. You see it coming up with different governments, different policies. When you go down, 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 you see that there's a quarrel, there's a matter, and it is against Christ. Christ is the offense that the world does not want to tolerate. When they killed disciples in those days, they thought that the message of Christ would stop. But to their surprise and to their dismay, it has spread. It has gone everywhere. The gates of hell could not prevail against the church. So the word to prevail against means they will fight. It means they will come out in arms against those of us that stand for the truth. Now, I just, you know, I'm spending quite a while on this because it's very fundamental. If it is clear to you in your spirit that to be a Christian is a call not only to believe, a call to suffer for him. If you agree that, look, I want to be a genuine disciple, then you should know that part of the package that comes with all the blessedness of the resurrected life, all the blessedness of the new creation life, all the things that Jesus gave to us in Christ Jesus with the victory. He said, anyone who lives father, mother, sisters, lands, and all of that, he said, in this world, he will receive a hundredfold of land, hundredfold of brothers, fold of sisters, hundredfold, hundredfold, hundredfold. But you know, he said, with persecutions is part of the package. You can't have one without the other. You can't enjoy the grace of God in Christ Jesus and run away from the persecution that was packaged along. I don't know whether you are getting that. So let's go on from here. So now, Mark, can you read that small summary under that section for us? Yes, sir. To a persecution is part of our calling as believers. Mm. If truly you belong to Christ, the world must persecute you. Yes. If the world loves you and speaks well of you, watch out. For the world only loves its own. Luke 6. Right. In John 15. Can, can you read Luke 6, 26 for us, Sister Soma? Luke 6, 26 says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Amen. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that? Say woe to you. Alas for you. When everyone speaks fairly and handsomely of you and praises you. For even so their forefathers did to the false prophets. So if you are just that jolly, jolly Christian that wants everybody to embrace you, you have no standard because you don't want the world system to have anything to say against you. The only thing that we can conclude is that you must be one of those false prophets. Because it is only those prophets that they were clapping for in those days. You know, in the days of Elijah, he was persecuted for standing for the truth. They placed a price tag on his head. And you remember how Micaiah was persecuted for standing for the truth. Whereas, we are men like Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, who was coming with a big loudspeaker, horn speaker, to come and prophesy goody goodies to the king. And when the young man came out to say, look, this is what the spirit says. You remember how they went and slapped this man and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to come and talk to you? You see, persecution is not only inherent in the people outside. 
Even the people inside church who love the world, they will still persecute you. So if we have persecution, even from those who claim to be Christians, it's because they are those who are in league, in friendship with the world system. They are those that have short measured the word of God. They are those that have reduced the standard of God's holiness. And they have brought the church to a comfortable position where it is not a threat to the world and the world system can easily flow into it and flow out of it. That's why they are demanding that our doctrine should be changed. That's why they are saying, yes, even though I am like this, you must marry me, you must marry us. What do you want to be married in the Christian church? When Jesus said, this is an abomination. But now because they have people who claim to be for Jesus, but who hated Jesus in their own heart, they are one with the world. So if you are persecuted, please take note, it is because you don't belong to the world. It is because the world system detests anyone who is not of his own. And this is why persecution will come. Now, can we quickly go to number B? Thank you. What is the reason behind our persecutions as Christians? We've been talking about it, but in order to answer it, why does the world persecute us? What's their reason? Now, let's quickly pick it again. We read John 15, which we've been reading, John 15, verse 18. So let's now go back again to it. John 15. I think, Mark, you read John 15, and you read it in the Amplified Version. So let's go back to it. Let's read John 15, verse 18 to verse 25 this time. Let's see how it sounds. Go ahead, sir. John 15, verses 18 to 25. The Amplified says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Mm. If you belong to the world... The world would treat you with affection and would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, no longer one with it, but I have chosen, selected you out of the world. The world hates, detests you. Remember that I told you, a servant is not greater than his master, is not superior to him. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, and obeyed my teachings, they will also keep and obey yours. Mm -hmm. But they will do all this to you, inflict all this suffering on you because of your bearing my name Uh and on my account, for they do not know or understand the one who sent me. Okay. I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin would be blameless. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me also hates my father. If I had not done accomplished among them the works which no one else ever did, they would not be guilty of sin. But the fact is, now they have both seen these works and have hated both me and my father. But this is so that the word written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let's read John 16, 1 to 4. Priscilla, can you try to read that for us so that we can pick it together? Yes. Do you think that I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble? They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. Mm -hmm. And they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these Mm -hmm. things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. That's good. Thank you very much. Now, what's the reason behind our persecution as Christians? The first reason is that 
because it hated Christ. The world system hated Christ. And because it hated him, all of us that belong to Christ and are no longer one with the world, they have transferred that hatred unto you. They detest you. You see, the word that uh, uh, Amplified introduced, he said, the word hates, detests you. They just simply have no taste to have you around. And it's not because of you. It's not because you are not looking nice. It's not because you are not intelligent. It's not because of anything. It's because you no longer belong to the world. It is because you have embraced Christ. Now, I love the way in which when our brother was reading that verse 20, he said, remember that I told you a servant is no greater than his master. It's not superior to him. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word and obeyed my teachings, they will also keep and obey yours. But they will do all this to you. They will inflict all this suffering on you because of your bearing my name. And on my account, for they do not know or understand the one who sent me. So I want you to note that the persecution of a child of God is because we are bearing his name. And it's because on his account, it's on the account of Jesus that we will suffer. But to us, it's a privilege to suffer for his sake. He said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. They would have been blameless. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me also hates my father. So you see, this persecution that we are talking about, it is not just you that the world system have hated. They have hated him and they have hated his father. So you know the battle, as Brother Paul put it in Philippians 1, he said, we are all in this fight. And it's not our fight. It is a fight against God and against his son Jesus. The apostles, you remember when they gave them serious beating from the Sanhedrin Council in Acts chapter 4, they came back, they said, why do the hidden rage? Why are the kings of the earth, why did they take confederacy together that they will not have this king to reign over them? So you see, the persecution that comes to you, to me, as a child of God, if you are standing, is because of who we represent. Is because of the name we bear. Is because of him whom we choose to be his ambassador on the face of the earth. That is the reason. And because it's a conspiracy against our Lord, we will not have this man rule over us. That's why they are raging. That's why all kinds of things are going on. You see, today is not the time for me to begin to look at the various forms in which we are going to be persecuted in the coming days. We have had persecution we are being put down by different people, but it's going to increase as the end of the age is coming. All those who will stand for the truth, all those who will refuse to compromise, the world system will try to isolate you and make us look as if we are miserable. They would like to make us look as if we are minority. And so we could be ignored. You go for meetings, just meetings. And just because you're a Christian, somebody will stand up first and foremost to dress down your face for no reason. The world system, they will continue to do everything. is because you are a threat against the world. 
And that's why they will first and foremost struggle to pull you down, to intimidate us. But Jesus said, if I had not done, I had not accomplished among them the works which no one ever did, they will not be guilty of sin. But the fact is, now, they are both seeing these works, and they have eaten both me and my father. And as long as you and me continue to carry that life, continue to do the right thing that Jesus told us to do, continue to preach the truth as we ought to preach it, this persecution will increase. It will keep coming. Now, I want you to take note of that John 16 verse 1. Priscilla, can you go over it again? Can we go over it again? Um, just one to four. Yes. Um, these things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will mm. put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these mm. things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I mm. have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not to say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Thank you very much. He said, so that we will not be offended, we should not be unaware or we should be taken unawares or caused to stumble or to fall away. That's why we need to do this. Even this part of this Bible study is deliberate. Because when God begins to move, there's going to be revival. There's going to be a divine visitation to wake up and to draw as many into the kingdom of God in preparation for the appearing of our Lord. But in the midst of that, the world system is growing worse and worse. You remember I asked you to read Second Timothy chapter 3. Instead of verse 12 alone, we read from verse 10, 11, 12, and 13. You remember that we said the seducers, they will wax worse and worse. Please let me Repeat that Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3, and I read verse 13. He said, verse 2, I say, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So this will continue, it's a parallel. While we continue to experience revival, evil men, the seducers, they will be waxing worse and worse and worse and worse. You should not baffle about that. And because if our light is so shiny, the only obstacle to the world system is you as a child of God. When you stand in any organization, in any office, and you stand for Christ, you are the only person they want to battle before they can continue. In fact, if you go to an office and you decide to stand for Christ and say, no, this is the truth. This is the way it should go. You suddenly discover that everyone else, they will join hands together to battle you. Because you are the only threat to the kingdom of darkness. So may I say that the persecution of a child of God is because of who you are, who you represent, and what God has put in your life that is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Let's read the summary under that number B before we go ahead. Can I ask Soma to read the summary under that section? The hostility of the world against Christians is a transferred hostility. The world hates us because it hated Jesus. Satan, the God of this world, is the arch enemy of our master Jesus and of anyone who follows Jesus and his lifestyle. I hope that is clear. That's what we have been saying. So when will I be free from persecution? 
only when I have denied Christ. When will the devil come to shake me with his hand with and gloves and say yes now? It's only when I have decamped from the camp of Jesus. But as long as I'm standing my position, I am his vast enemy until the end. And so persecution, don't, I don't hope to get out of persecution, dear brothers and sisters. Because as long as the arch enemy of Jesus has not repented and has not changed, how can he become my friend? How can he come to support me? In fact, if the world system begins to support what I'm doing, I will suspect them. I will know that they are playing a prank. I will know that they are planning something. And I will need to quickly check. Is it because I'm beginning to give them hope that I can belong to them? Is that why they are trying to quickly support me? Because all I expected them to do is to hate me as they have hated my master Jesus. Right, let's go to number C. We are going to pick examples of people that were persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And we are going to discover their own persecution. I'm hoping that within the short space of time we have, we'll be able to just run through this. Now, we have laid the principles. We are only showing that there are people that have gone before us who were so persecuted. Discover the persecution each of them passed through. Those who persecuted them, and for what reason they were persecuted. That's what we want to be checking here. Let's quickly look at David, the young anointed, particularly when he was youngly anointed. Let's see the issues that he was confronted with. In First Samuel chapter 18, let's quickly check First Samuel chapter 18. We'll ask Priscilla to read that for us. First Samuel chapter 18, 6 to 9. First Samuel 18, 6 to 9 says, Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that mm. the women um, come out all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they've ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. All right. Now, Let's go to 1 Samuel 19 from verse 1 to 5. Can you quickly check it, Soma? 1 Samuel 19, 1 to 5 says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, because his works have been very good towards you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Read on. Okay. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Continue. Thank you. No, it's okay. Let's stop okay. there. First Samuel 24, 11. Brother Mark. In the New King yes. says, Moreover, my father, see, yes, See the corner of your robe in my hand, for in that I have cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt for my life to take it. You hunt my life to take it. 
Now, so let's quickly look at that. Now, Psalm 119.161. Priscilla, can you try to read Psalm 119.161? Just for us to conclude that and then we discuss. It says, princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. Mm. They persecute me without a cause. They persecute me without a cause. But my heart stands in awe of your word. Now, what is this? What was the reason why Saul was going everywhere to hunt for the life of David? You will notice again here that the first thing we are noting is that here is Saul full of envy. Here was Saul, he could not stand the good things that God is doing through David. David did not organize those women. It was not even David they came to greet. It was Saul that the women came to welcome back. And they were simply rejoicing with Saul. To say, God, look at what God has done. You are slain thousands. And this is your small boy. Whom you just released. Has slain tens of thousands. And you are praising the Lord. Unfortunately. It fell into the evil heart. Of Saul. And what was Saul going to do now? He said, eh See, they have attributed to me only a thousand. But to David, they have attributed tens of thousands. What else? Let him take the kingdom. That's a wicked man who has lost bearing with God. He had lost direction with God. You remember that In the earlier chapter 15, he had disobeyed God. And God had rejected him and said, this man can no longer be my king. So you see, you will suffer persecution, let's take note of that, from those whose work with the Lord has started to be wumbling. Any person who has backslidden from the truth it will be one of the foremost people that will persecute you when you are standing for the truth. Please take note of that. Sometimes you will see that the persecution of believers have been so accentuated by people that have tasted the word of God before and they are backsliding. So please don't be surprised that every persecution you find is because someone hated the Lord that you are carrying. And they hated the way you are standing with him. So those that are backslidden, those that have gone back, those that their lives are no more congruent with the word of God, when they see you standing for the truth, when they see you vibrantly following Jesus, they are likely to take up arms against you. It is because their new position now is contrary, is actually antagonistic against the position of the Lord Jesus. So please, again, when you see persecution, it could come from pastors. It could come from preachers against you. Just know in your heart something went wrong with that man somewhere. You may not be bold to open up and say, look, I missed it one time. That's why I'm persecuting you. I'm sensing that the more your light is shining, it is revealing my wickedness. It is unveiling the reckless life that I've now entered. If you were a compromiser like myself, I would have felt a little more comfortable that I was not alone. But when your life is shining the correct light, you are making me feel miserable. You are showing me what I have lost. But instead of him to come in humility and say, brother, please pray for me, he will pick up an arm. I wish 
Saul only called David and said, the way God was with you. Please pray for me that what I miss, God should restore to me. It could have been a wonderful thing, but he will not. From that moment, he started eyeing David. So can you see that Jonathan kept saying to his father, my father, why? Why must you sin against your servant David? This man took his life in his hand to go and face Goliath. And he brought glories and victory to the children of Israel. What has he done? Why are you looking for him now? Why do you want to? And he has not done anything wrong against you. So let me note now that persecution, for it to be a correct persecution, it must be that you are only being persecuted for righteousness, not for an evil thing you did. It is not persecution when you suffer for a wrong thing that you have done. It is persecution when you are being attacked, when you are being revived for what you have never done. Falsely, they are speaking against you. That's when it is genuine biblical persecution. So let's ask Brother Mark to read the summary under David, the young anointed. David was persecuted by Saul, who attempted to kill him. The reason for his persecution was because David a young man, killed Goliath, the Philistine giant, whom Saul the king was afraid to confront. Saul became jealous of David and sought to kill him. Your righteousness or success in life, in business, in your place of work, or even in ministry may cause your leaders to persecute you. Amen. Right. So take note that these leaders... Is because they have shifted in their work with the Savior. Please take note of that. They will only persecute you because they are now entering into darkness. Because the Bible says, whosoever hated his brother is still in darkness until now. Whatever will make any man To be so jealous as to want to cut down a brother simply because he's shining in the light of the word of God. Just know that that man is in league with darkness. He is an accomplice with darkness. Whosoever hates you because of the life of Christ in you, He is in darkness. That's why he did it. Now, what did they do to Jeremiah? Let's look at Jeremiah the prophet. In Jeremiah 37, verse 4 to 16. This time we'll ask Priscilla to please read Jeremiah 37 from verse 4 to 16 for us. Now, Jeremiah was still going in and out among the people, for he had not yet been in prison been put Mm. in the army of pharaoh had come out of egypt and when the chaldeans who were besieging jerusalem heard news about them they withdrew from jerusalem then the word of the lord came to jeremiah the prophet thus says the lord god of israel thus shall you say to the king of judah who sent you to me to inquire of me behold pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to egypt to its own land and the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus mm. says the Lord, do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of the Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men, every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn the city with fire. <laughs> Now, when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion there among the people. When he was at the Benjamin gate, a sentry there named Erijah, the son of Shalomiah, son of Hananiah, seized the prophet saying, are you deserting the Chaldeans? And and, and Jeremiah said, it's a lie. I'm not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Erijah, who would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and 
and brought him to the officials. And the officials were enraged at Jeremiah, and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, for it had been made a prison. And when Jeremiah had come out to the dungeon cells and remained there many days. Amen. Now, that's another servant of God that suffered persecution for simply preaching the word of God. They had now cast him into the dry dungeon simply because he was speaking the truth. When people don't want to hear the truth, they will persecute whosoever is preaching the word of God. I know I have suffered so much persecution over many years. Not for anything else. Just because we preach Christ and him crucified. Just that we will point to Christ as the only narrow way. And that the only way to serve God acceptably is to pattern our lives after the pattern which is Christ himself alone. So again you see Jeremiah being cast into prison simply because he had preached the truth. People like Watchman Nee in the days in China, they were persecuted, their tongue were caught, their big tomb was caught simply because they will not stop preaching Christ and him crucified. So the underground church in those days suffer persecution simply because they will not compromise the word of God. But you know there's an official church that had no problem with persecution, that were enjoying government patronage because they have short measure the truth. If you agree not to preach Christ and him crucified, the world system will actually come with a handshake for you. And so we will still need to take a stand. It is not that the church, the world will not tolerate a church that they have doctored. Even in the end time, there will be official churches that only say what government want to hear. They are going to sponsor them. They are going to give them a lot of taxpayer support so that they will not stand to declare the truth of the word of God. They will not have the liberty to be faithful to the scripture they will actually have to continue to edit the truth until there is nothing pricky in it anymore. But if we are going to be faithful, men of old like Jeremiah, they were cast in prison. But God delivered them. God set them free because they stood for righteousness. Let me ask Brother Mark now to read the summary under Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah was beaten and cast into prison by a captain of the guard and the princes of Israel in Jerusalem. He was persecuted because he prophesied the truth and spoke the word that the Lord put in his mouth, even though it was not in favor of his people, the Israelites. They felt he was supporting their enemies, the Chaldeans. For preaching the truth, we can be persecuted. Amen. Mm. For preaching the truth, we can be persecuted and we should not be surprised when it comes to us. Now, let's look at Daniel, the administrator. We are looking at Daniel who was in the civil service to see again how even in civil service, in secular government service, a child of God will be persecuted if you stand for the truth. Let's go quickly to Daniel chapter 6, and we'll quickly read 1 to 17. Soma, can you read Daniel 6, 1 to 17 for us? Yes. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, and that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave 
thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor Mm. was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Mm. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Mm -hmm. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petitions three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So he gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke to Daniel, saying, Your God, whom you serve continually, He will deliver you. Amen. Thank you very much. And verse 17 said, Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Did you see the challenge? They said, They've been looking for every opportunity either to find fault or to discredit or to reproach Daniel. They found none. They did all their researches. There was nothing he did amiss. There was no error or fault in him. So they came to a conclusion. Look at their conclusion that was the basis of this spurious persecution that came, they said, the Bible said, this man said, verse 5, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. That's the point. We will not find anything by which you can implicate this man except it has to do with the law of his God. That's the only place. We know that he will not succumb. We know he's so faithful to his God that no matter what we do, he will not. So let's devise something that will run contrary to his faith. Again, I want you to see this now. They made a decree that nobody should talk to anybody, should make a prayer or petition to any God or man for 30 days except to the king and anybody who does shall be cast into the den of lions. You know that they know that this young man cannot but pray. So this particular decree was actually aimed at catching and implicating Daniel. Now, where is the persecution from? Let's imagine that if Daniel had said to himself, well, it's only for 30 days. 
Even if I don't pray for 30 days, that does not mean I'm not a child of God. And decided to suspend praying for those 30 days in order to escape that persecution. You can escape persecution by lowering the standard. You can escape persecution by avoiding to stand for the Lord. But the Bible said, when Daniel had heard and I knew that the writing was signed, he went home and he went in his upper room with his windows open. Wasn't going to do it secretly. With his windows open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. This is what he had always done. This had been his own lifestyle. It's the kingdom lifestyle that he had been living. And, you know, since the temple of Solomon was set, it was said that wherever they are, anybody who opens the window of their heart towards Jerusalem, God should answer them. So that's why he did. And they were waiting. They just want to catch him. And they, he knew. And he was not a coward. He was not going to compromise his faith just to escape. Just like last week, I was talking about the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who said, oh king, we don't need to talk to you about this. Our God is able to deliver us. And if not, we prefer to be burnt alive than to bend or to bow to your idols. Again, we saw a Daniel here standing. It was sheer envy that brought all of this. It was because he would not allow them to embezzle government funds. It was because as the first of the vice presidents, he was not going to allow the king's business to suffer damage. So some of you will be persecuted in the civil service. Some of you will be persecuted because you are refusing to allow kickbacks. You are refusing to allow bribery and corruption. Some of you will be persecuted because you are uncovering a fraud. You are not agreeing onto a conspiracy that will have moved millions, millions out of the government coffers. You'll be persecuted. And the persecution they have here is how to execute him outright. But they know that there's nothing they can find except concerning the law of his God. But Daniel will not, because of that, lower the standard. He went on praying as he used to do, as was his custom since early days. That's what he did. Of course, they came, they arrested him. They cast him to the den of lion, but God delivered him. So let's take note that persecution had always been like that. But you are persecuted because you are standing for the truth. You are standing for righteousness. You are standing for God. Now let's read. Let's ask Priscilla to read the summary under the Daniel, the administrator, for us. Daniel was made one of the three governors in Babylon to whom the 120 satraps appointed over the kingdom would give account. Because Daniel distinguished himself among the governors and performed excellently, the king thought of setting him over. It was this that made the governors and satraps to devise a means of finding some charge against him. However, they could not find any fault in him except concerning the law of his God. They cast him into the den of lions and laid a stone on his mouth. On its mouth, he was persecuted for being righteous, not willing to compromise his prayer life and his commitment to the true God. Thank you very much. Dear brother and sister, can I find out how many times have you simply because you don't want to be persecuted? You seem to have been clever by short measuring or by lowering the standard or by denying even your little prayer life. 
Sometimes you are so ashamed to stand for Christ because you think people will criticize you. To pray over your food. Sometimes you say to yourself, well, I can just speak into my heart. I can just do it. What does that mean? Why are you so ashamed of mentioning the name of Jesus? Look at your colleague who is a Muslim or whatever. How boldly he will stop an official meeting. Say he wants to go and pray. But for you, because of persecution, you have suspended everything. You have behaved as if you have no obligation to Christ. Now I'm asking you, all those who will live godly life in Christ Jesus, they must suffer persecution. The Bible said, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. It's part of our call. Let's go to number four there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we dealt with that last week. So we don't need to go back on it. I only want Soma to read the summary under it, and then we look at our Lord Jesus. All right. They were persecuted by being cast, well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were persecuted by being cast into the burning, fiery furnace because of their faith and commitment to the true God. They refused to bow to the gods of the Babylonians. They were accused and reported by the Chaldeans to King Nebuchadnezzar, who proceeded to persecute them. You will remember that last week as we now read, because of their stand, because they did not fear the wrath of the king, though they went through that persecution, we said the kingdom of God was established. We saw that Nebuchadnezzar fell on his knees and and made a decree that only the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego is the true God that must be worshipped in all his realm. I said last week that persecution has always been the vehicle by which the kingdom of God had been established. And the kingdom of God suffers defeat when the people of God compromise and decide to avoid the persecution that comes with it. Now let's take the final note that we can take for today. Let's look at our Lord Jesus Christ himself suffering persecution from his own countrymen. Let's read Luke 4, 18 to 30. Brother Mark, you will take that for us. 17 says, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all who bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the lands. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the <coughs> Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. 
So all those, so all those in the synagogue, when mm. they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you can see that story again. Why was he going to be thrown down? Simply because he was preaching the word of God to them. Was speaking the truth. He was confronting them with the truth. He said, today this gospel, this word of God must be fulfilled in your midst. And for that, they began to rise. He said, yes. It's not that a prophet has no honor, but a prophet has honor, but not in his own country. With that, they stood up. And you see, they were going to throw him down. They went to the very top of the hill and they were going to haul him down into the ditch. God delivered him. So we want to note that even our Lord Jesus was persecuted by the people in the synagogue because of his preaching and claiming that the prophecy in Isaiah was fulfilled in him. In Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. When they had him, they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill to cast him down over the cliff. But God delivered him and he went to another city and continued preaching. I think we will stop at this point today and trusting that when next we come, God will permit us to be able to now go ahead and look at what must be our attitude in terms of persecution. We are taking this very slowly because I perceive that we need to prepare disciples, particularly in this end time, to take their stand. When by God's grace we come in our next Bible study and we begin to look at what our attitude must be, We are hoping that we will be able to train ourselves, disciples all over the world, because this battle is not going to be localized. This persecution that comes our way and is coming is going to be global as well, because the move of God that will cause a very serious dislodgement in the kingdom of darkness is also going to be resisted. Satan is going to want to find tooth and nail if he can contain this light and not let it shine. But there's nothing he can do about it. There's nothing he can do about it. I was studying the word of God today and he said God rules with his power forever. And all the inhabitants of the earth, they are less than nothing before him. Let not the adversary think he can do anything. For the eyes of the Lord watches every movement in the nations. There's nothing that the confederacy of Satan can achieve. God rules and reigns over the nations. So those of you and me who want to stand for Christ, we need to prepare. We need to set our mind. This is part of our privilege. It's a privilege to suffer for him. It's a privilege to suffer persecution for the truth. Now, if you will short measure the word of God, the world system may no longer hate you. If you will dodge speaking the truth as you know it in the word of God, if you will stop, you know, speaking against sin as sin, then the world system, they would like to put you in a class of those that have been accepted in their fold. But you know the Bible says, friendship with the world is enmity against the Lord. As we stop here today, I want to ask you, if this be our privilege, it is not only given to us the privilege of believing Christ, of receiving him, of experiencing his saving power. 
we also have the same privilege of suffering for him. Would you like to join me today to say, Lord, prepare me. Help me to stand for you. It's a privilege to stand for the man of Calvary who went to the cross on our behalf, who delivered us from the tyranny of sin, of the flesh, and of Satan. And if the enemy hates you, it's just because they hated him. And because you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness, that's why your little you, you say, but why are they worried about my little self here? Why can't they ignore me? They can't ignore you. Because he who is in you, the Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. The one you represent is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. That's why they don't want you. So when we read in the book of Hebrews, it said, these men, they were not of whom the world was not worthy. They were persecuted, they were chased here and there, they were hunted down because they were the only threat to the kingdom of darkness. And so we will again be as we go on as disciples. I want to pray that God will strengthen each one of us and that you will take your stand. Daniel took his stand. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego took their stand. The Lord Jesus Christ took his stand. Jeremiah took his stand. All the men of old took their stand and the gospel advanced. The kingdom of God was planted here and there because the disciples then were not, the, in fact, the Bible said they did not care about their lives. As I stop here and I pray with you, I want to ask God to help us. I want to ask the Holy Spirit to grant you understanding that as we go through this scripture, don't forget Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Say, blessed are you. So let me finally read that Matthew chapter 5 to conclude as we go to God in prayer again. Matthew 5, just to remind you where we started. Chapter 5, verse 10, verse 11. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May the Lord give us understanding and give us courage to stand for the truth, to be counted for Christ at a time like this, when many are compromising, when whole churches are signing and entering into things that are contrary to scripture, simply because they are afraid of being labeled as extremists. Will you pray and say, Lord, help me to stand, not to deny you, not to deny you, in this present wicked world. Shall we pray together? Let's pray together. Father, this moment we thank you for your word. We thank you for our brothers and sisters who have come along with us in this study. Some are asking questions in their hearts. Will I be able to stand? Some it is, they, they may be looking at when a very big persecution will come. But no, There are little, little, little opportunities you have given us to take a stand. If a man cannot stand for the truth in his small class, how will he hope to stand against the entire world? And so this day we pray, please release wisdom to our hearts, release strength to our spirit, and bring us forth to be able to stand for the truth. We are your ambassadors in this present crooked world. And you have called us to live only, to live soberly, and to be a witness. Please strengthen our hearts as we individually take our stand. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. Thank you for when we meet again, that your help will be sufficient for us. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. 
Amen. Amen.